Good afternoon. The Association of Food and Drug Officials, Food Protection and Defense Committee, and the Association of American Feed Control Officials, Education and Training Committee, are excited to be hosting a webinar today to help food and feed regulators and industry learn more about the deadly African swine fever disease and its impact on the pork industry. It's estimated that 50% of the world's pigs have either died of ASF or been killed to stamp out the virus. Today, animal health, animal food, and industry experts will explain the disease's transmission, food supply impacts, as well as the steps government, industry, and producers are taking to help safeguard and protect the United States pigs. The webinar will also discuss the active preparations the United States is taking to respond to ASF if it were ever detected in the country. Our first panelist is Dr. Steve Halstead. Dr. Steve Halstead is a Michigan native with a rural agricultural background. He graduated from the MSU College of Veterinary Medicine, after which he practiced mixed species veterinary medicine in rural Maine and Michigan. Dr. Halstead has experience working as a field veterinarian for the Michigan Department of Agriculture, all the way to being Michigan State Veterinarian for nine years. He's currently the Field Operations District Director for the USDA APHIS Veterinary Services. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, April. So uh, I, it looks like the slide sets are up and ready to go. Mine is anyway. So um, just to bear with me, just one more moment here. Okay. Um, so I've been asked to, to talk about African swine fever. If we could go to the next slide, please. There we go. Uh, and my, my presentation this afternoon will cover three, three main points, three basic points. I want to talk about the, the African swine fever virus and the disease, African swine fever, a little bit about the history of the disease, and, and then uh, most importantly, the impact that we are experiencing and that uh, we anticipate and, the, and are preparing for. So if we, next slide, please. Just a recent headline. Uh, there have been lots of these, although other disease news uh, at present is bumping some of this from the from the front page, perhaps. But uh, this dates back a few months now, but uh, it's still current, and we're we're seeing uh, this disease as it has expanded in China and spread out of China and uh, well, and out of Africa in general, uh, to become a, a significant disease uh, having impact on markets around the world. Uh, next slide, please. So what is African swine fever? Uh, keep going. Next slide, please. It's a, uh, it's caused African swine fever. The disease is caused by the African swine fever virus, which is a, a large DNA virus, an envelope virus. And the virus is unique in that it is the only member of the genus uh, Aspaviridae, um, and that name comes from African swine fever virus. You can see it in the uh, in the title. Um, it's the only known arthropod-borne DNA virus, meaning it's spread by arthropod insects or, or uh, uh, creatures. And I, um, we recognize that there are. More, there are 20 genotypes of the virus to date that have been identified. These genotypes or, or strains vary greatly in their virulence with uh, highly virulent isolates causing generally 100% mortality, while lower virulence strains usually lead only to serial conversion, and that, uh, that is that they, they may not be evident as having caused illness in the animal, but they will be recognized by the animal and the animal will develop antibodies that can be measured. All of the genotypes are present in Africa where the disease originated. So far, we've only found genotypes one and two outside of Africa. Um, and this is just a photomicrograph of, of the virus. Next slide, please. So transmission of the disease. Generally, what we see is that it can occur by direct and indirect contact with infected animals, their bodily fluids, or tissues. The virus can, can be directly transfer, uh, trans, transferred from uh, to susceptible swine from infected swine. And in swine operations, exposure is most commonly via the oral nasal route, um, saliva, ocular secretions, nasal discharges, nasal secretions. 
and uh, but that isn't the limit. The virus is found in all secretions and excretions from infected animals. So um, we find it in, in all bodily fluids and all tissues with particular, particularly high levels in the blood. Even after animals' death, the virus is quite resistant to inactivation. It can persist in the environment. And uh, that is, again, a, a factor in natural spread of the, of the, of the virus and the disease. There's great concern as well that, uh, uh, or about the transmission that can occur indirectly, such as through feeding of uh, waste products, swill, garbage, or or uh, feed materials that are intended for human consumption that might not find their way to the human uh, human food chain uh, and end up in any of these other uh, other uses or or other disposals. And that's been linked to transmission of the, the disease and occurrence in uh, previously uninfected countries. And it's, again, great concern uh, about ongoing spread. Next slide, please. So continuing with transmission, we, we recognize that the, the virus, because it can contaminate uh, through contact with saliva, uh, nasal secretions, blood, feces, other um, other secretions from the animals, that uh, inanimate objects can become contaminated. Uh, we call these fomites. Uh, so things such as clothing, equipment, vehicles, um, feed handling machi material, machinery, uh, any of those sorts of things, hands, feet, boots, uh, or feed. And there is a significant concern within the U.S. pork industry about the potential for introduction of African swine fever virus to the U.S. and other countries through feed materials that are uh, well shipped, moved from China or other affected countries. There has been quite a bit of work done on that, and many of you on, on the call probably are more, much more familiar with that than I am. Uh, looking at uh, the ability of the virus to survive in in transport in feeds, uh, that work is ongoing. Uh, to my knowledge, at least as of discussions late last year, uh, there wasn't strong conclu conclusion about uh, um, the potential for that and the and the, the risk involved. So, uh, the as I understand it, the question is still an open question. Uh, there's concern in in piggeries that uh, environmental contamination and and further shed can occur through uh, bleed outs from pigs that are affected as they die and or pigs fighting and the uh, and bloody diarrhea. Again, the virus is in the is in those secretions and in the blood. Uh, we know that it can survive for several days in feces and possibly longer in urine. And it does persist uh, in frozen tissues, carcasses, and and uh, other tissues. Um, aerosol transmission has been reported. It's limited, but it has occurred in laboratory settings, and uh, may be a factor in transmission from wild pigs to outdoor raised uh, domestic pigs. We also know and and, and recognize that in the, the the country where this virus, in the areas where this virus originated. Uh, the soft tick, soft ticks of the species or Nithodorus are uh, uh, the natural, are involved in the natural transmission cycle. Those ticks can pass the virus vertically, so uh, from from uh, tr through offspring, and will retain the virus in uh, in the ticks that can then become sources of infection for additional swine. Uh, that, and that graphic there just shows a, a, a similar, several of those mechanisms that, we just, that I've described here. Uh, there's also concern about the transmission through biting flies and the possibility, uh, again, in laboratory settings, it has been confirmed of transmission via lice. Next slide, please.
just to run through what we see, some of the clinical signs. Uh, typically, acute cases of African swine fever are characterized by high fever, uh, anorexia, or, or inappetence, lethargy, weakness, and recumbency. They just won't get up. You can see uh, disfigurement in the skin, uh, erythema, and you'll see that that's what that's what's demonstrated in both of these pictures. The lower lower uh, photo, um, specifically, and then also in the upper photo, you can see some necrosis that's developing in a in a uh, seriously affected area, uh, and then also hyperemia, which is just a um, red discoloration of the skin. Next slide. Again, more uh, um, indications of what we see in clinical signs. Typically, they'll, they'll have diarrhea or they may be constipated, but they, they will always show signs of abdominal pain or indications of. Uh, the diarrhea can initially be quite mucoid, but later it becomes bloody. Um, commonly, they'll abort, and then there'll be visible signs of hemorrhage, uh, nosebleeds, hemorrhages in the skin, as we saw in the previous slide and respiratory signs such as dys, uh, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, nasal and conjunctival discharges, and uh, neurological signs have also been recorded. Uh, here in this photo, these photos, you can see the hyperemia in the, in the feet and uh, bloody, blood-tinged nasal discharge in, the, uh, in the, the snout photograph. Next slide. Uh, I should mention that in acute disease, as I said, uh, with the, the more aggressive serotypes, uh, death is almost a certainty. We'll also see subacute, also see subacute disease where they aren't nearly as uh, severely affected. A lot of the same same presentation, just uh, less intense. Uh, abortions might be the first sign that that might be recognized. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And in this, in those cases of subacute or chronic disease, the animals will typically recover in three to four weeks, and uh, um, although not fully. So with chronic disease, again, a lot of the same things, but less uh, less impacted. They are generally stunted and will continue to show emaciation, uh, have persistent respiratory problems, swollen joints, and and uh, intermittent diarrhea. And they may, and, and ultimately they may succumb because of the complications and, and secondary infections and, and such. Uh, next slide, please. So, just as a quick uh, summary of what we advise practitioners, uh, veterinarians, uh, and, and uh, uh, swine operators, uh, that they, they are required to report the disease as a suspected foreign animal disease, and and as such, immediately notify animal health authority, authorities, USDA, uh, or uh, state animal health authorities, and um, initially quarantine the animals until further diagnostics are done. Next slide. So where did the uh, where does this come from? Well, just a just a like kind of a pointer here to to help me show where we are. But this series of slides just shows the the transfer or travel of African swine fever up the Arabian Peninsula uh, into Russia in in 2008. Um, Ukraine uh, is is center of the world right now, obviously, uh, but uh, represented there to the left above the Caspian Sea. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Black Sea, and and then all of Russia above. And you can see at the very top of these slides, Finland in the green to the, the very left. Uh, there's been great concern by the Finnish government about um, movement of the virus into Finland. They've, they've erected a fence along the, the border between northwestern Russia and, and, and Finland uh, in hopes of keeping pigs from moving in. We have seen, uh, I think, next slide, please. Uh, concern, and this, this just, again, depicts where outbreaks of African swine fever have occurred in the past. And, and uh, in Asia, you know, the present uh, concerns. Uh, but at the top of, in Europe, the top of the um, slide, you can see a green triangle. That represents infection in Poland, which is right on the, the German border and has the German authorities extremely worried. Uh, they have built a, a, a very uh, 
rugged fence along the border that is concrete three feet into the ground and I think it is I'm not sure what the height of the fence is but it's a substantial barrier and there hope there's hope that it will keep the the wild pigs from getting into um, into Germany that way next slide please so where are the pigs? Well, it's estimated that uh, we know that uh, China has the largest swine population in the world. And to date, with this outbreak, they've lost about half of those pigs. You can see uh, down the, the uh, y-axis there that, we, that the U.S. is somewhere around a fifth of the total, U total world swine population. Uh, so a substantial player, uh, next largest as a single country to, to China. And of course, a, a significant trade partner with um, about 25% of our pigs are uh, marketed internationally, and so it's it's important for us to maintain our free status. But also, we bring pigs in from other countries, and to and it's important to make sure that we don't import the disease through live animal movement as well. Next slide, please. Uh, moving into the the, the risks. Um, of transmission, of course, live animal movement is, is a concern. But as I mentioned before, the virus is throughout the body and, and will be found, can be found in lean meat portions, and uh, is or potentially is a source of transmission that way through the uh, unintentional introduction of that material to swine operations or to feral swine uh, through landfills or other disposal, improper disposals. Cooking, of course, kills it, and the virus has no impact on humans. So consumption of the virus is not a concern for humans, but uh, the, the concern is the fact that it's in the tissues, and, and there are tissues that end up in other places. Next slide. We don't have a vaccine. There's nothing that's, that's uh, uh, in development that looks to be promising at present. There are no treatments. Uh, the virus is quite resistant. And we know that it persists and exists in feral swine, and uh, the transmission can hurt, occur quite readily from feral to domestic pigs. They're really not any different. So the primary protection of the industry is through biosecurity practices that uh, uh, the swine industry is is extremely well versed in and and has practiced well to, to date. Next slide. Again, uh, risks and, and threats, uh, just a, a collage of different possible sources of uh, garbage in the top left photo, uh, swill that there could become swill. Uh, going clockwise, the Asian markets that we've heard much about, especially with the coronavirus that we're seeing circulating in China and, and worldwide now. Uh, introduction of, of uh, meat scraps, through garbage feeding or disposal, improper disposal, and as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the fear that feedstuffs could be contaminated and could serve as a source of introduction. And of course, the, the picture in the center there is, is one of our, our beloved Beagle Brigade dogs with our Customs and Border Protection uh, unit and some confiscated meat products there that are showing up in the suitcase, uh, again. Uh, possible means of introduction. Next slide. So the U.S. wine pro uh, production, uh, it's primarily centered in the Midwest, uh, and you can see the colors of the slides there. Most of most of the production, as I said, Minnesota, uh, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, uh, a little bit uh, a, a, a concentration in North Carolina, and a little bit in New York, Michigan. Uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri. Uh, you can see the states as well as so I can read them off. Um, that's where our commercial swine operations are. And if we go to the next slide, I believe, yes, feral swine. Uh, and this map is outdated. It's not that old, five years old now, but we, we know that we have or have had feral swine in all of the Midwestern states and, and probably in all states. So the, uh, there's great concern uh, for, for maintaining those populations separate, keeping feral pigs from having access to domestic swine and, and vice versa. Um, 
they can serve as reservoirs for if they survive the virus uh, for life. And um, uh, there's always the potential for for cross exposure. So we have uh, uh, for that and many other reasons they can also harbor foot and mouth disease virus and our uh, a, a, a blight on the landscape. Um, much concerned about the expanding feral swine population in the U.S. Next slide. So where are we going? I think you have to click through these one at a time. Yeah, we're, we're uh, very uncertain at this point what's going to happen. The Western Hemisphere seems to have protected itself pretty well, but uh, we have seen African swine fever and foot and mouth disease virus uh, approach some of our neighbors to the south in, or, uh, through history. So uh, there, there's concern about vulnerability there. Uh, click again, please. Uh, diagnosis is difficult to make early. It's, uh, it has the potential to spread broadly before we recognize that we've got this disease uh, on hand. Next, uh, next bullet. Uh, yeah, you can see there that uh, we, we, our production uh, will be uh, production will be impacted and exports will immediately stop if we're infected. Next uh, bullet. Uh, will affect the uh, the prices certainly and and continuity of business. It could change the picture of pork production in the U.S. dramatically. Next next bullet. Um, measures for response involve regionalization, compartmentalization, and uh, permitting for movements. But it will follow an immediate stop movement, and uh, that. The estimate right now is that there are approximately a million pigs on the road in trucks every day. You can imagine a uh, stop movement of two to three weeks, perhaps, uh, and a very, very uh, impactful damage to the productions, uh, to production producers and production systems. Next bullet. So uh, it's not something that would go away immediately. We would. Um, um, We'd be working for many years probably to become free again and reestablish those markets. And, and the picture of swine production, pork production in the U.S. would probably be changed forever. Uh, next slide, please. So it's all about prevention and preparation and keeping it from getting here in the first place. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Steve. And as far as questions go, we'll try to hold some time at the end that you can uh, send your questions and our panelists will answer those. Our next speaker is Jenny Murphy. She's a consumer safety officer in the Office of Surveillance and Compliance with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Center for Veterinary Medicine. In her current position, she is responsible for overseeing the center's involvement in implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act, and she serves as the agency lead for preventive control for animal food regulation. She is currently FDA's lead for African swine fever and serves as an agency expert on the integrated food safety system. Welcome, Jenny. Thanks, April, um, and good morning slash afternoon to everyone. Um, so if you could go to slide two, please. So this right now, what we're going to talk a little bit about is kind of jurisdiction and government, um, primarily focusing on FDA's role in African swine fever. Um, so here's a, a general snapshot comparing and contrasting USDA and FDA jurisdictions in some key areas as they relate to Foreign Animal Disease Authority. And here in this presentation, we're really focusing on African swine fever and then food regulation. When it comes to foreign animal disease prevention and surveillance, USDA is a lead agency for the government. FDA may have a role if a foreign animal disease is spread through animal food and in the review of approval of any potential mitigants that might be considered either a food additive or a new animal drug. So the middle portion of that slide really highlights the food products that are under either USDA's jurisdiction or FDA's jurisdiction. And I'm just going to leave those there and not cover those today. As we've really had conversations with the pork industry um, over the, the past year or two, um, one of the questions that does come up is how does USDA Swine Health Protection Act intersect or not intersect with FDA's preventive controls for animal food regulation? At a very high level, compare and contrast is that while the Swine Health Protection Act and the preventive controls regulation are both focused on prevention, they have different scopes. 
One is specific to swine food and only applies if there are meat ingredients included. And the other is broader for all animal food and includes the individual ingredients that go into it and the finished product. And another difference is who, it, who these regulations applies to. Swine Health Protection Act primarily applies to farmers making food for their pigs, but could go broader if needed. And the preventive controls regulation applies to FDA registered animal food facilities and would not generally include farmers making their own food. Next slide. So again, USDA has a lead. They have been doing the lion's share of the work. And a lot of people say, kind of, FDA, what is your role and what are you doing? Um, we've really been working closely with our colleagues at USDA as we consider animal food as a potential vector for disease transmission. Some of the examples of how we're collaborating them, we do meet routinely with our colleagues at USDA. We exchange necessary data and ideas of how different jurisdictions can interact and work together. Um, we've coordinated some with our China office for potential joint USDA, FDA inspections in Chinese pet food facilities. We collaborate on messaging and we share ideas on regulatory strategies. Both agencies have also been working closely with the pork and animal food industries and academia through the Feed Risk Task Force. And each of us coordinates on our action items and to-dos from the, the meetings that that task force held. One was in June of 2019, and the other one was in September 2019. FDA has been routinely in contact with the animal food industry on this subject, and we continue to provide subject matter experts for various meetings and conferences, and when invited, um, when we're invited to those, and we serve on USDA's expert elicitation on non-animal origin ingredients, um, looking at the risk of ASF from those ingredients. When we can and when we're, we're asked, we participate in industry or state government-driven exercises. We were able to participate on the tail end of the USDA big national exercise that was held, um, and it really helps us to be able to figure out where we can help out. Um, Another a couple things we've done is we have developed and maintained a field bulletin alert to FDA staff, particularly those doing foreign inspections on precautions to take in African swine fever positive regions. As Steve mentioned, another a potential vector is through boots and human transfer, and we just want to make sure our investigators are aware so that we aren't one of those bringing that back here to our country. Uh, last year, FDA formed a broader ASF working group with the primary function being to develop our African swine fever response plan. We're using our experience with things like the avian influenza outbreak and PEDV to help inform that plan, and really USDA has a big animal, foreign animal disease plan, but ours is really focused on the animal food, including how we can ensure that animal food will not help spread the virus domestically during an outbreak, and how we can still move food in and out of facilities to, show, to get to other animals who may or may not be impacted by this virus. Um, this plan is still under development, but we do have our current infrastructure that deals with large-scale responses that we are leaning on. Next slide. So we do recognize that animal feed can serve as a potential vector for the transmission of this virus, and that data is continually evolving. Um, however, there are a lot of unknowns that we just don't have the answers to. As I like to quote one of my favorite academics, um, Cassie Jones from K-State University, the speed of the virus is moving faster than the speed of the science, and that really holds true. We can't get all the qu answers to all the questions that we might have. But three of the significant gaps in the data are kind of what is that natural route of contamination of feed ingredients. In a laboratory setting, we proved that if you put the virus in the feed ingredient, that virus can survive. A new research that shows it can survive and cause transmissibility. The question is how is it getting into it in the first place? And where that helps us figure out is what ingredients may pose the biggest risk. Is it a, an easy way and a routine way of that product becoming contaminated? Another significant gap in the data is around testing, particularly in the feed. There is no regulatory test for the feed. But before we can really think about what a regulatory test is and what we would do is, what was the, what, how would we interpret that result? A lot of these are PCR-based and it's detection of DNA, but if we have it, what does that mean? Um, is it just that we detect the DNA? Is it full? Is it partial? Is the virus active? Is it not? And a lot of that can lead us to interpret results in a different way. We ha 
we need to continue that conversation. Um, we don't have all the answers yet, but we need to continue the conversation. Another big data gap is what is the appropriate mechanism for control on animal feed? Is it through a heat system? Is it through some type of pressure system? Or is it through some type of chemical mitigant? We have the new preventive controls regulation in place, and we think that food safety regulation will help. That there are some gaps in the data, particularly around how to control this virus in the feed, but we're, we're continuing to look and evolve that. Next slide. One of the potential ways to control African swine fever is through the animal feed supply. Um, FDA's Center for Veterinary Medicine is responsible for reviewing new substances used uh, for animal food or new animal drugs. And we have committed to the industry through our management chain, you know, through our center director, that we're going to put in an expedited review process for anybody that's submitting a possible mitigant that would help address this virus. That's not a promise we routinely make. Um, and the likelihood is we would be focused on safety of the ingredient and the use level, and then utility. Can it actually do something to impact that virus that is going to have positive impacts on the feed supply? Next slide. So some people may ask kind of why is that in important? Um, and there's a number of reasons why I do think this is important. Um, and to go through appropriate review channels. And it's necessary in the best interest of both the pork industry and the animal food industry. Um, in some cases, people have said, well, we're using stuff that's already approved and we're saying it is used for salmonella control. And they're just saying, we'll just put it in there and say it's for salmonella control. The pork industry is a feed industry's customer and the feed industry wants to do that but asking them to do something that might put them in the position of doing something that's considered illegal. And trust me, as we get further into this, state officials or FDA officials are likely to flag that up on our radar, and we don't want to stop something that could be helpful. Um, one of the things that is a concern is the use level established with these things and consistency in that use level. An appropriate use level is needed to make sure we know the minimal level that would be needed to control African swine feeder and whether there's a maximum on which safety concerns exist. Without that use level, you can see people putting in a lot more of something, and it may cause safety issues. Or if it's expensive, they might say, oh, I can get away with a little bit less, and then they may not actually be doing anything to impact it. Another reason you start to worry is if people are hearing these things and they're just throwing stuff into the food for the control of the virus, they may become less vigilant in things like biosecurity. So it could create a false sense of security, which would lead to lapses in other areas that would need to control. And lastly, another reason for this is the approval process is is in potential to impact our ability to ship animal food out of this country if the virus were ever detected here. We're in a global economy. Our animal food is shipped all over. And many of our trading partners and import-export markets are closely following African swine fever. The U.S. government has a long history of being well-respected for our pre-market system. So having that FDA stamp of approval is going to be incredibly valued, particularly if you want to market this product in other parts of the world or if we case we hit it to show that our feed is still safe. So those are some things that we are doing and want to continue to work with both the pork industry and animal food industry is on. And with that, I will turn it back over to April. April. Let's try that. Hello? Hear you now. Thanks, Jenny. Our next speaker is Dr. Porter, Barbara Porter Spalding. She's a senior staff officer with the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS Veterinary Services in Raleigh, North Carolina. She holds a DVM from Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine, Go Green, and a Master's of Veterinary Public Health from North Carolina State University. In her current position, Dr. Porter Spalding serves on the National Preparedness and Incident Coordination, NPIC staff. She's the director of the uh, Veterinary Services Training and Exercise Program. Before joining APHIS, Dr. Porter Spalding worked in a dairy practice in Pennsylvania and spent two years in Morocco in the Peace Corps and also worked on food safety inspection service activities in North Carolina. 
Um, she became the regional epidemiologist in Raleigh, working on issues in poultry, swine traceability, and foreign animal disease investigations. She served on the swine commodity staff prior to joining NTIC. Welcome, Barb. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, exercises. We're going to talk about keeping, uh, keeping it out of the country and how do we practice uh, if it gets in the country. And so uh, we have, as many of you may already know, uh, created a number of projects this past year. Um, and the exercise and, uh, and, and planning that we've done with these exercises is only one of those. Um, there's been enhanced surveillance. There's been um, a, a lot of laboratory work with the National Animal Health Laboratory Network and a lot of mitigation with uh, Customs and Border Protection. But we're going to focus on the exercises. And so next slide. Um, our exercise series was, of course, prompted by the industry uh, coming to veterinary services when ASF started circulating in China particularly. And so we decided to commit fiscal 2019 uh, on these highly aggressive timeline and these projects. And we determined that uh, the biggest bang for our buck would be to include uh, the top 14 swine producing states in this series of exercises. And then, of course, um, many industry associations, both at the state level and the national level, and, uh, and, and sort of new for us, we even got private sector companies involved. Next slide. So the first part of the process was to have a policy workshop. And so we invited those state veterinarians from those top states and many of the national industry representatives, and we hashed out what kinds of policies do we already have that can be adapted for African swine fever, and what kinds of issues do we still not quite have policy around that we want to be uh, creating policy, using these exercises to generate policy, and make sure that we're as prepared as we can be when we come out at the end of this year of exercising. And so that uh, resulted in a great discussion, and we conducted an after-action report that's available. And that led us to a number of discussions, next slide, around many of the issues that we deal with during uh, an outbreak response. And so in veterinary services, if any of you have ever looked at our foreign animal disease preparedness guides, we talk about 23 critical activities. And so the policy discussions quickly tended towards um, the activities that you see on your screen, surveillance, diagnostics, epi, information management. And then as the year progressed and we went from one exercise to another, that was further honed down to those key uh, activities that, um, that folks deemed the most essential for us to get practice doing these exercises for. So next slide. So the second exercise in, a, in the series took place in February of 2019, and that was a planning workshop for those 14 states to stay comfortably at home in their own emergency operations centers and uh, work, bring in their industry and their emergency managers and talk about planning. What would be required for them to take their current foreign animal disease response plan, or maybe it was an FMD response plan, a foot and mouth disease response plan, and turn that into an African swine fever focused plan. And so we focused on those 13 critical activities that we mentioned before. Next slide. And the goal of that exercise was really to let the states take a look at what they needed to tackle, how they needed to change their plans, and um, what entities were going to be the most critical to make that happen. And so this third exercise was conducted. A lot of questions, a lot of uh, answers came out of that, and an after action was reported. And then that was quickly rolled over, next slide, into the third African swine fever exercise. So this was a tabletop. And each of the states needed at this point to have an incident management team, and they needed to cover these planning objectives. So between the workshop and this tabletop, they had to have actually tried to update their plan and put in place those parts of the plan that would be required. And then this tabletop is a chance for them to functionally discuss those different aspects of the plan that would be needed to go through these various objectives. And so by this time, we're honing those critical activities down even further towards those that the states and industry felt were most important. And so we reached the point where we're talking about having a, a foreign animal disease investigation and having the industry more fully understand what that looks like when our folks show up 
on the farm to do an FAD investigation. Um, bringing in the introduction of that thing we called a movement standstill. So we introduced this idea of a rapid 72-hour give or take movement standstill that might happen at the very beginning uh, when we discover we have a foreign animal disease in this country during an exercise we conducted in 2018 called Armour. Now that one was for foot and mouth disease and so this time we again introduced that movement standstill and the states had a chance to talk about um, how they would institute that for intrastate movement which the state has the authority and then how we would collaborate all together to do a national movement standstill if that was required. So we also talked about how are we going to manage uh, infected premises, set up control areas, depopulate and dispose of those, and then implement the secure pork supply plan in order to permit um, negative farms out of a control zone. And so again, this was done as a tabletop with each of the 14 states playing individually at home in their emergency operations centers. Next slide. So after that, um, pretty rapid turnaround, we get to September of 2019. And so at this point, we convert that tabletop into a functional exercise, which means that there are components of this exercise now where they will actually have to conduct those operations right up to the point of spending big amounts of money to move equipment or you know move an entire team. We weren't gonna do that kind of thing. But if they needed to make a phone call, uh, and, and the governor's office was playing in the exercise, then they had to make that phone call. If the governor's office wasn't playing in the exercise, then what we have um, uh, is called a simulation cell. And so that sim cell is pretending to be the governor's office. And believe me, they're going to call you and they have questions and they want answers. And so all of this was very operational. And, um, and they had to produce incident action plans for their daily operations and they had to also produce a situation report. And then all of those products were wrapped up and we're just now completing the after action process of creating a draft report, having a series of after action meetings to discuss the findings and the recommendations, and then we will get that report approved and have that report out in the next couple of months. Next slide. So during this fourth exercise, um, we did something a little different. We decided that each day was going to be a specific critical activity that had to be conducted. And so that way we were sort of getting rid of a lot of the other components of an operational response that, yes, they would be going on, but we really wanted these states to practice these critical activities. So on the first day, they actually sent foreign animal disease diagnosticians to a producer's farm who had agreed and volunteered to participate in this exercise. And then they actually had to have those discussions with their local National Animal Health Laboratory Network Lab and uh, the Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab. The second day, we set that aside, and the total focus was on managing that rapid national stop movement. What did that look like in your state? You had to put out press releases. You had to put out the publication of your authorities and exactly what you were going to do with that. And so that was a very uh, important and interesting day. Uh, the third day, they actually had to send operational people out back out to that same farm that had done that FAD investigation and discuss among themselves um, operationally what was depopulation and disposal going to look like on that farm. And then they had to produce an incident action plan which mimicked what they would actually begin to do the very next day to initiate depopulation on that farm. So involved a site review and um, often mapping what is ingress and egress from that site going to look like. What kinds of line of separation are we concerned? What is the barn configuration and how are we going to get depopulated pigs out of that barn? All those kinds of things they had to discuss and then produce an incident action plan. And then the fourth day, uh, we let them take a breather from that and uh, the whole fourth day was around setting up your control area, putting out a press release or some kind of announcement so that USDA would know exactly what that control area looked like, and then doing continuity of business out of that control area. And so each of those 14 states was using the emergency management response system that USDA provides to actually initiate permit requests, and then the state of origin would review those requests and the uh, potential state of destination had to go in and, and approve that request or deny that request. We also um, had those actual producers from the first and third day going in and using what's called the gateway, which is a web-based um, tunnel into the EMRS 
where they can actually put in their own permit requests and they would also, we didn't practice this, but they would be able to upload uh, any kind of biosecurity plan that was required. Um, test results would be coming in from the laboratory network. And so the state reviewing that request for a permit would have all the information that they would need. And then if that permit is approved, oftentimes it's approved for uh, a number of days or weeks, then each time a movement off that permit needs to occur, they would be putting in a test result showing that they're indeed negative that the biosecurity is still in place in order to do that. And so those were four exhausting days for everyone. Next slide. You can see we had a lot of different participation at the state level. The state of Iowa, I give them a lot of kudos. They had a lot of observers and they actually opened um, two or three different areas around the state where producers or others could come in and actually listen to what was going on and then somebody would be there to answer any questions they might have. And so we had international observers in, in our Emergency Operations Center in Riverdale, Maryland. We had FBI people show up. Um, and then mo most importantly, the fact that we had these private sector swine production companies and producers um, working with us through this exercise series, I think was a really, really uh, a good innovation that we had, along with uh, a lot of discussion around, you know, was the uh, individual siloed days the appropriate way to do this, or should we have just let the three or four days flow together? Um, but I really like the fact that we separated these days and so they made sure that they had to meet that mark for that required activity that we expected of them that day. Next slide. So why do we do exercises? So it's a chance for states to um, enhance their plans, um, look at their capabilities and see what kinds of additional training or resource needs they might have. And more, most importantly, probably from my perspective is, there's always competing interests during uh, a foreign animal disease response. How do you balance disease control against continuity of business? How do you balance the resources required to manage an infected premises versus resources required to make sure that non-infected premises can get back to business? And then of course, intrastate commerce versus interstate commerce and what on earth happens to international trade and how will that have an impact on, um, on domestic production and, uh, and continued business. So next slide. Uh, during the exercise, we were able to produce maps based on the, the information that the states were feeding us. Again, the 14 states stayed at home, exercised at home, used producers who were in their states, and then we had the incident coordination group, we call it, in USDA, and they were up in Riverdale. And then the simulation cell was also in Riverdale, feeding questions and issues to those states as they played. Next slide. So major after action items coming out of our exercise that we continue to discuss and deal with are um, things like expanding sample types. So we continue to work with the Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostic Lab and what does that look like? That we can continue to expand the kinds of tests that we can run, the kinds of samples we can take. Um, and also, what will surveillance look like? So we had a draft surveillance plan. This is surveillance for after you have a finding, a positive finding. What kind of surveillance are you gonna set up in your control zone? How are you gonna get yourself um, through all of the continuity of business testing and what does that surveillance look like, both on the individual farm and then in a control zone? Uh, so next slide. Um, yeah, this is a map then of um, the states that enacted a movement standstill. And so as they were working through their authorities and getting those set up, they would notify the incident coordination group and we created the map. That day, the outbreak um, notionally began with Mississippi. And so that way, none of the actual playing states was involved with a positive um, but it was only Mississippi and they had to begin by addressing, would I uh, institute a movement standstill if it's not my state? And then later in the day, they had it in their state and they had to see how that movement standstill would change. Next slide. And so out of the movement standstill, we heard a lot of things about uh, consistency, um, a desire for more consistency and coordination from the industry and more of a role for USDA to make sure that consistency existed. Next slide. Then, um, of course, when you're doing depopulation, there's a lot of questions around um, how are we going to indemnify producers for pigs? Um, how are we gonna pay for depopulation activities and disposal activities? And, um, and we didn't really exercise it in this particular activity, 
but even beyond that to things like virus elimination and what that might look like. And so um, we've had high path AI among the poultry industry. They're very aware of what that looks like now, but we have not had, thank goodness, a foreign animal disease in any of our larger livestock species. And so we continue to work on those indemnity um, payments, um, the differences between what the CFR says and what the administrator and the secretary can actually implement. And, uh, and that will continue as we go through more exercises. Next slide. Um, there was also a lot of talk about methodologies, um, people talking about ventilation shutdown plus and what that might look like, and even some states wanting to know about wildlife services and whether they could be relied on to provide um, any depopulation support. Uh, next slide. And then again, the virus elimination question. And so we continue to conduct research and try and collect enough data so that we can even try and figure out what a flat rate sort of virus elimination reimbursement might look like if we were going to allow producers as they're getting out of having an infected farm and they need to go through that cleaning and disinfection process, what does that virus elimination look like? Because we don't have a lot of data on production during the high path AI outbreak. We collected a lot of that data. Uh, next slide. So then that final day with permitting, because it was all done through the emergency management response system, we can sort of see through this, um, how that process works through requesting, um, reviewing, and then either approving or denying them, and then actually applying movements against those permits. And so you can get a little bit of an idea of the kinds of activities that happened. Next slide. And again, here, it, it, it shows you um, of the kinds of permits that they put in, uh, whether it was direct to another farm or direct to a slaughter plant, um, what that might have looked like, and how we can track that very easily in our emergency management response system. And the next slide. So for that permitting day, some of the after actions that came out of that was that we need to continue to train people in EMRS and how to do that permitting, how to help an incident management team manage that huge permitting uh, workflow that's going to have to happen in order for us to ever reach a point where we can regionalize and have an international trading partner maybe trust our transparency and, and sort of allow some of that trade to come back into, into play. Um, if we can document what we're doing well enough, maybe that will be possible. And then also to work with the packer industry. So that's one thing we've just gotten started is kicking off some um, uh, meetings with uh, representatives from the North American Meat Institute and some of the big companies on if we were going to put together an exercise series for African swine fever for swine packers. Um, and maybe we need to include renderers. Maybe we need to include the feed industry because there are products, obviously, that come out of these packing plants that then go on into the feed industry. And so we're just getting started on those, but that was definitely heard loud and clear um, as an after action coming out of our year-long series that we can continue to work on other aspects of this. And so I've enjoyed the privilege of getting to talk to you folks. Next slide, please. Um, because maybe some of our future exercises will relate back to some of those further ingredients that come out of the industry. And so with that, I'll stop and, uh, and we look forward to the final speaker. Thank you, Barb. Our next speaker is Cindy Cunningham. She's the Assistant Vice President of Communications for the National Pork Board, and that's headquartered in Des Moines, Iowa. Cindy, I'll let you go ahead and get started as we're wrapping up on time. Good afternoon, and I know we're bumping up against our time, so I will uh, move rapidly through these slides. Uh, so if we can move to the next slide, please. We want to look first at what's happening in the industry as far as our crisis planning. And I think it's very important to understand that although I represent the National Pork Board, the pork industry has agreed to a unified crisis response plan. We use this crisis response plan for many different issues that we respond to uh, throughout the year. But specifically for African swine fever, you can see the organizations that are teamed up there, the National Pork Board, National Pork Producers Council, Swine Health Information Center, American Association of Swine Veterinarians, and North American Meat Institute. Each of these organizations has their own specific role in a crisis and a and specifically in the ASF crisis response plan, but by partnering together, we're able to, to ensure that we're reaching all of those 
those different areas that we cover. Our next slide talks to us about the two plans that are in motion today. And I think it's really important to understand with these two plans, we have a plan that is currently active and has been since August of 2018, looking at with African swine fever in other parts of the world, what do we need to be doing today? And then also the when and if plan, when and if ASF were to be confirmed in the U.S., how would we deal with that as an industry? And, and clearly, we have split this into two primary audiences. Many audiences are subsets of those two primary audiences, but producers and consumers with the two plain and simple goals of protecting the U.S. swine herd and then ensuring confidence in U.S. pork in the event of an ASF outbreak. Our next slide, actually, you can bounce two slides if you would, um, takes us into producer communication. So we wanted to touch on each one of these areas just briefly and kind of walk you through some of the materials and the activities that are available. I'm really focusing today more on the communications tools that have been sent out to our producers, clearly created with our operations teams and our vet teams uh, in conjunction and cooperation with APHIS and other partners uh, throughout agriculture and throughout the U.S. So uh, on the producer side, uh, making sure that our producers know what is going on and what to do with an FAD situation and preparing for the big event, the, the ASF, if you will, or whatever that FAD event may be. We want to make sure that we are mitigating the risk of that big event tomorrow, but also enabling our producers to have a good response if that occurs. So there are activities, uh, biosecurity and things that have really been, been pushed with our producers over the last uh, year and a half in ensuring that we keep it out of the U.S., but also moving to make sure that they know what to do should it, should it occur. On our next slide, we talk about the main communications tools, and these are really kind of the areas I want to spend a little bit of time and help everyone on the call to understand what's available to them. Pork.org slash FAD is the home base for, for production information from the industry to our producers and to those who are part of the production side of our industry. And you will find everything available on, on this pork.org slash FAD website that will, uh, that producers and production, um, folks will need. We have a lot of information that is on this site, uh, in very specific and detailed, um, uh, is very specific and detailed. It also comes to us from our partners at APHIS, from our partners that you've heard from today, as well as, as other information and research for, for our producers. The next slide also covers some of our main communications tools. First and foremost, the Foreign Animal Disease Bulletin. Um, this bulletin, as you can see, the audience that it's delivered to is very critical and very important and free to anyone. If you are not receiving the Foreign Animal Disease Bulletin by email, again, it's on that website, but we, we would be happy to get you added to that email list. It contains the latest research, the latest findings from across the globe, as well as what our producers are and need to be doing uh, in their own farms. Our next slide also looks at producer communications tools, and you can see a wealth of information that has been distributed to our producers. On the far left, those are actually barn posters. Uh, they are large and laminated and intended to be hung in a barn and can be power washed and are designed for the folks who are there uh, in the barn working every day to be able to glance up and say, oh, I'm not sure I like the looks of this. It's on the poster. I need to do something about it. Um, available free of charge through our website. And then you can see a number of other tools that we have, uh, everything from fact sheets on how to host international visitors um, to looking at um, what's happening with research and keeping vigilant and, and information on checklists as you prepare for foreign animal disease. The next slide that we have talks about our uh, pork industry text alert system that we have in place. I would encourage everyone on this call and anyone who is, has anything to do with the pork industry to go ahead and sign up for this text alert. This is designed, much like your school system, to notify you in the event of what we call a red level crisis in the pork industry. This will not be used for any promotion or anything like that. It will simply be used if there is 
a major foreign animal disease outbreak in the pork industry. So we encourage you and, and all of our producers uh, to sign up for this and have had great success signing up for that. I do want to move to the consumer response real quickly. Um, and that consumer response, I think, is really important as well because our next slide will will uh, take us into the consumer. Actually, one more. There you go. Um, understanding what our consumers will do in the event of an ASF confirmation in the U.S. and what they're doing today with ASF and other parts of the of the world. Clearly, we want to make sure that we can first drive consumer confidence of U.S. pork, and that is uh, we're focusing on two two primary audiences here in the U.S our English-speaking consumers as well as our Spanish-speaking consumers. The messages that you hear, and you hear these messages repeated often by anyone who's talking about ASF um, across the globe and, and especially here in the U.S., is pork is safe. ASF is not a human health or food safety concern. It is a disease of pigs, not people. Our plan is also to generate engagement should we get ASF here in the U.S., uh, making sure that we're getting information out and correcting misinformation. The next slide leads us into baseline consumer awareness. We've done a tremendous amount of work and research right, right now of understanding what U.S. consumers know and don't know about ASF. As you can imagine, it's not here in the U.S., so the knowledge of ASF is very low in the U.S., um, but there is a gap in the understanding that it's not a human health concern. So our responsibility and our role is to make sure that our consumers, if we were to get it here, understand that it is a disease of pigs and not people. Um, our research also does show that, that it will prompt some concerns. Um, however, the messages that we've tested, the disease of pigs, not people, and ASF is not a public health concern, your pork is safe, test really highly, and, and that's important for us. Our next slide talks about a new consumer campaign that we are working on. So in August of 2018, when ASF first started to make its march across the globe, we really focused on a crisis response, and we built a $6 million digital campaign that is ready to launch at a moment's notice should ASF be confirmed here in the U.S., again, with the goal of keeping our consumer confidence uh, in check. With that, today, we are able to um, work on what we're calling Campaign 2.0 knowing that we're ready today, but we want to be better tomorrow. This campaign actually takes a look beyond just those basic messages, and it moves us into, okay, what will we do as um, we have more pork sales to build on? We want to not just hold that consumer confidence, but be able to move more pork, knowing that our, our trading partners um, will be blocking our products, so we'll have a lot more pork on the U.S. We are just in the midst of focus groups. In fact, I spent last night in focus groups in Richmond, Virginia, and it's very interesting to see um, the uptick from where we were a year ago with knowledge about ASF, but also um, holding steady about the concerns of, of ASF should it get here in the U.S. So we will build out an additional campaign uh, should we get to that point. And my final slide is a matrix of the consumer tools that we have. I really wanted to just step through this really rapidly. Um, again, English and Spanish on all of our consumer tools, knowing that here in the US, uh, those are the key markets that, that we're focused on, in addition to some other languages as well. Clearly, media coverage, uh, we want to understand what's happening in the media and trending and how we can make sure that, that um, we are providing what we can and providing the, the appropriate messages and correcting misinformation in the media. Uh, I talked about those messages, the consumer website that is live, and I would encourage all of you to go to it and use it as a tool for those who may have questions from a consumer standpoint, factsaboutpork.com. You can see it on the far right of your screen, and it matches with our digital campaign. Uh, that, that young female farmer there standing in her barns looks confident and comfortable with the situation and is dealing with, uh, dealing, wanting you to know that her pork is safe. This is a disease of pigs, so we are using pigs, not pork in the, in the ad campaign. The four videos that you can see there, um, are, a, a ladder up series. The first video is designed to answer those most basic questions. It's a chef 
uh, from South Beach, Miami, um, geared to a very specific foodie audience, if you will. And then we start to progressively go up as we move through a medical doctor. And then we also have a video with the uh, public health veterinarian for the state of Iowa, all the way up to a pathobiologist, Dr. Dan Rock, um, to talk about the specifics of why people cannot catch uh, ASF. So um, videos, paid campaign, everything that we have, social, digital, and one other area that I really wanted to mention is our allied partners. It has been tremendous to see agriculture come together um, in support of the pork industry to this point already and as we plan and prepare for uh, a potential confirmation here in the U.S. It is, it is uh, always good to partner and it is always good to partner with folks who have a vested interest in, in agriculture and, and in moving forward. So with that, uh, my last slide, I would just say thanks for letting me be a part of this. And if there's anything that the pork industry can do to assist you in your preparations or any questions that you might have, uh, just let us know. Thank you, Cindy. With all the unknowns we learned about today with African swine fever, it's, it's helpful today to raise awareness and it's reassuring to know that our animal health and our industry and producer partners are doing all of this work to prepare and raise awareness. So thank you on behalf of AFTO, AFCO and our panelists today for listening to our webinar. I think at this time we may have a minute or two for some questions and I'll pass that over to Randy. Okay, looks like we have one question that came in. If AFS is detected on a farm, how big would the control zone be? Not directed to a specific presenter. So, you know, traditionally, um, when we talk about foot and mouth disease, we've always sort of talked about a 10 kilometer control area. And foot and mouth disease is a much smaller virus and is much more easily carried um, in an airborne way, sort of on the wind. Um, with the things we're hearing out of China and out of the long experience of the Europeans and, and much of the industry working in Europe, we've had, we've been having conversations, especially with trade, our trade staff around reducing the size of that control zone to as little as five kilometers, perhaps, but m probably more importantly, also making sure that we very rapidly deal with the traces and the linkages that a, a, a particular production site may have with part of their system or network within their company. And so I think both of those things are going to be equally important to jump on quickly with African swine fever. Thank you. Uh, next question. Do we know if ASF affects all swine? Yes, um, this is Steve. Um, certainly all of, uh, um, yeah, I would just, I'll just say yes, <laughs> uh, as far as uh, domestic and, and feral hogs. Uh, Barb, do you have anything specific to, um, to you know, any, any other species? Uh, only that the reservoir host uh, seems to be the warthog in Africa with the, the tick that lives in its burrow. And warthogs tend not to get sick with African swine fever, but continue to provide a nidus of infection for other wild hogs in Africa, which are slightly less impacted. And then obviously when it spills over into domestic pigs, even in Africa, it can be quite deadly. This is Cindy. Our talking points talk also about pets. Uh, and we have changed our talking points to now say non-swine pets uh, cannot get ASF because of the concern of, of folks who may have a pet that is of swine origin. Good message, Cindy. Excellent. Thank you. And I believe that is our last question for uh, this afternoon. So once again, thank you to our speakers for taking the time to present today. Uh, thank you to everybody who attended. If you do have questions, come pops in your mind in a few minutes or a couple hours, feel free to reply to that invite and we'll make sure to get your question answered. Uh, but at this point, I'd like just like to thank everybody and that will conclude our webinar for today. Thank you.